Well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Vladimir Alexandrov today, who is here to talk about a wonderful new book that is just out. Um, he's been on the Kojo Nandi show today, uh, giving talks at, uh, at Howard, and um, I think tomorrow at Ruski Mia. Um, it's a book that I think will be of interest to lots of different kinds of communities, um, uh, scholarly uh, uh, communities as well as uh, as well as uh, sort of wider readerships called the Black Russian. Uh, professor Alexandrov uh, is a uh, professor at Yale, where he's the B. E. Bensinger Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures. Uh, his teaching research is focused on 20th century um, Russian literature, 19th and 20th century Russian literature and culture. He's written books on Andrei Bieli, on uh, Vladimir Nabokov, uh, on Tolstoy. And uh, we were just talking a little bit before uh, we came down here. This is the, the first kind of foray, in a, in a way, into, into history writing, into yes. sort of straight up history writing, and, and that is also biographical and also moves between two very different worlds, the uh, late Russian Empire and the late, uh, in a way, although they didn't quite know it at the time, the late Ottoman Empire. Um, and uh, but that is very much uh, the story of the life of this remarkable individual who is at the, the heart of this book, the black Russian himself, uh, Frederick Thomas. And uh, we'll turn it over. Um, to I have my phone. cell phone here, not because I'm planning to make or take a call, <laughs> but because it has a timer on it that'll help me keep track of the time. So the story of this book that I'd like to tell you begins with my reading a sentence six years ago that changed my life. I was preparing a graduate seminar on Russian emigre culture between the wars, and I was reading the memoirs of Alexander Virtinsky, who was a very popular singer in Russia during the First World War, and then in the 20s and 30s in the emigration, who's popular to this day. Virtinsky was describing how in 1920, um, he escaped from the Bolsheviks in the south of Russia uh, to Constantinople, and when he landed there, he wrote, and I'll translate, I began to perform in the outdoor entertainment garden of our famous Moscow Negro, Fyodor Fyodorovich Thomas, the owner of the famous Maxim in Moscow. And I remember that I was so surprised that I closed the book and put it down because I had studied this period. I knew something of what popular culture in Moscow entailed, and I'd never heard of anything like this. And of course, you all know that to this day, if you ask a reasonably well-educated Russian person on the street in Moscow, name the most famous black person in pre-revolutionary Russian history, they're very likely to say that it's Abram Ganyibal, who is known because he's the ancestor of Alexander Pushkin. But of course, the crucial thing is that Ganyibal lived in the 18th century, in the first parts of it, and uh, there were no other famous black people who were permanent residents in the Russian Empire in the latter part of the 18th century or in the 19th century. So I was immediately intrigued. And like anybody else who finds a new fact that they want to know more about, I Googled it and uh, <laughs> nothing came up. So I used Yandex, which is the Russian variant of this search engine. And what came up was Virtinsky's sentence. So uh, I was hooked by then. And I started looking in Yale's very rich library collect collections. I came up with very little, and what little I came up with was contradictory. And then I realized that I had a gift ahead of me that was unique in my life because I had a sabbatical coming up, a full year off. And I decided that I was going to spend it all trying to figure out who this enigmatic person was. I wound up uh, taking research trips to Russia, to France, to England, uh, I worked in various places in the United States. By proxy, I hired people to start poking around in places like Rotterdam and Buenos Aires that would have gone there too had they found anything worth perusing. And in the end, I actually pulled together quite a bit of information about this man. I hired people to work in Turkish archives. Three different researchers all said there's nothing there, so it's likely that that's true. If it had only been one, I wouldn't have been as sure about it. But uh, there are other ways to get access to information dealing with the Allied occupation of Constantinople after the First World War. So the man's real name was Frederick Bruce Thomas, and he was born in 1872 on his parents' farm in Cahoma County, Mississippi, which is part of the Delta, 
and the delta is known as the most southern place on Earth in that it embodies all of the most characteristic and worst features of the Old South in ways that you can readily imagine. Um, it's clear to me that Frederick Thomas got his wings from his parents because they were absolutely remarkable people. They had been slaves until the end of the Civil War. But in 1869, uh, they bought at auction a 200-acre piece of land for uh, $20, uh, a sum that had to be paid off over the course of three years. And within a year of owning that piece of land, the 1870 census evaluated their holdings as being worth some $5,000 in 1870 dollars. So they made several hundred times what they had invested in this property in terms of the value that they had achieved. Um, this, of course, uh, carried a penalty with it because they were now a very rare kind of black family. There were some 250 farms in this county in 1870 of varying sizes. Only six belonged to black people. And this one was the second largest of all the black owned farms. And what I'm getting at is that they stood out. And standing out in the South after the Civil War would exact a terrible price. But that was still in the future. And what happened uh, also with them that uh, showed uh, the remarkable kinds of people that they were is that a decade after they had bought the farm, they donated an acre of land to the local African Methodist Episcopal Church system to found a chapel on their property, so showing a kind of a commitment to uh, the local black community that would also resonate in Frederick Thomas's life in particular ways later on. Anyway, uh, Reconstruction ends in the South, and the white power structure begins to reassert itself. In 1886, a rich white planter who owned thousands of acres of land, as well as all kinds of other real estate worth a great deal of money, decided to steal the Thomas farm from the family. Uh, he did this largely because he resented that a local black family had become as prominent as the Thomases had become. Initially, because the Thomases knew him, they thought that the ruse that he had developed was a legitimate claim against them, and they went along with it. But very quickly, they decided that they were being cheated. And this is when they showed remarkable spine and character, uh, something highly unusual in the South at this time. They took the man to court. And even more unusual was that they won on the local chancery court level. Now, this was not simply due to the local legal system favoring truth and beauty. Uh, the lawyers that the Thomases hired happened to be a political opponent of the white planter's lawyer. So it was a fight between white lawyers for political advantage in the local affairs, but the beneficiaries initially were the Thomas family. The white planter was so incensed that he immediately appealed his case to the Mississippi State Supreme Court, where the case dragged on for easily another six or seven years without ever being fully and clearly resolved. In other words, despite the disparity between justice dispensed to whites and justice dispensed to blacks, even the State Supreme Court could not quite throw out the claim that the Thomases had made about having been cheated. But by 1890, and Frederick by this point is 18 years old, having been born on that farm in 1872, Mississippi had become the uh, lynchingest state in the South. And given the kinds of passions that this case had inflamed in Cahoma County, the Thomas family decided to be prudent and move to Memphis, which is the nearest sizable town, only some 70 miles away. So far enough away to be safe, close enough to keep track of the complex legal process going on. And this was the beginning of Frederick's acculturation to urban culture. He continued his education, which began for him in that chapel on his parents' land, because as you know, uh, black southern churches were traditionally places where, which functioned as schools as well as houses of worship and for social reasons. Uh, he went to a school for black youth in Memphis he began to work for an upscale grocer as a delivery boy. But that's when another tragedy struck the family. Uh, the father was murdered by another black man 
When I first discovered this, I thought that this was some kind of proxy murder by the planter in Cahoma County, but there is no shred of evidence of any of that. I think it was that Frederick's father was a decent man who got involved in an ugly domestic dispute and paid the price uh, with his life. But this marked the disintegration of the family, <clears throat> and it marked Frederick's departure from the South. Uh, every step that he took on his life path after this point in 1890 was breaking the mold of what was possible, what was habitual, what was typical for young black men in the South at this time. Rather than stay in Memphis, he decided to go north. And this was decades before the Great Migration began in earnest after the First World War, which is when first hundreds of thousands and then eventually millions of black Americans went to northern cities seeking improved opportunities and freedom. So he went to Chicago first, then to Brooklyn. Both cities had minuscule uh, black populations, somewhere around 1.3% at that time. And of course, although the situation for black people there was better than in the South, there were limitations in what they could do. So Frederick became, by training uh, over some period of time, a waiter and a valet. And he became really good at both. Uh, one example of this is, for those of you who may know Chicago, is that on South Michigan Avenue, uh, there now stands a place called Roosevelt University. This was originally built as the Auditorium Hotel in preparation for the World's Fair of 1893. It was, at the time, the fanciest and most technologically advanced hotel in the United States. The hyperbolic rhetoric around it uh, made it into the eighth wonder of the world. But it was a very upscale place to work, and that's where Frederick began. So if the first job that you have in a given industry is a kind of a tuning fork for the rest of your career, he began at the highest pitch. When he moved to um, Brooklyn, which was not yet part of New York City, he worked as a valet uh, for a very prominent businessman who was on the verge of uh, becoming, in another few years, the biggest owner of vaudeville entertainment theaters in New York City. So again, Frederick was rubbing shoulders with, if you will, somebody who uh, could give him models for what to do later on. Frederick also had a passion, which can be traced back to the culture of black southern churches, which was singing. He had a German emigrant teacher in Manhattan, a man whose last name was Hermann, who advised him to go seek further training in London because of the color line in the North and in New York specifically. And so in 1894, Frederick again broke the mold. He bought a ticket, he got on board a ship, and he went to England. And this was decades before uh, black Americans began to expatriate themselves by going to places like Paris. Again, that happened primarily after uh, the First World War. Now, uh, Frederick did not succeed in gaining enrollment to the musical conservatory in London that he wanted to attend. I thought initially it was due to racism again, but it turns out that he didn't have the money to pay the fees and they would not allow him to work his way through school. And I found out that England at this time was uh, very accepting of black people. Uh, the Brits were racists with regard to South Asians, and they were anti-Semites. But they treated black people perfectly equitably. The famous civil rights fighter from uh, Memphis and newspaper editor, Ida Wells, who has a, uh, a history, uh, who is remembered in the history of civil rights uh, fighting in the South, at around the same time, around the early 1890s, mid-1890s, uh, also went to England to um, proselytize against the campaigns of lynching in the United States and was received very well. The only white people who objected to black people in England, especially if they saw a mixed race couple at a restaurant, for example, in London, or at a ball at Oxford University, were white American tourists. They exported their racism with them and they would come back to the United States and write angry letters to the editors of the hometown newspaper saying that you're not going to believe what I saw in London. There was a black man and a white woman sitting at a fancy restaurant having a meal, and nobody saw anything wrong with this. So it was this kind of accepting attitude that uh, fed into Thomas's decision to stay in Europe. He moved to France. He picked up French quickly, 
and fluently. I found a memoir of uh, him uh, about him in which he was described as speaking pure Parisian French one moment, but as soon as he said anything in English, it was Southern American black English that came out. He then uh, traveled through Germany. He went to the south of France on his way to Italy, uh, wanting to learn Italian. Um, he had very portable professions because by being a waiter at an upscale place in the United States, you could also be a waiter anywhere else. And with French as the second language of the world at that time, uh, you could work successfully at upscale places pretty much anywhere, which is what he did until the late 1890s when um, in Monte Carlo he seemed to have caught the eye, as he subsequently remembered, of a R Russian visiting nobleman. His recollection of what rank this person had varied with his moods later on. Sometimes he said it was a grand duke. Uh, it's possible. I didn't find any references to black servants in the retinues of Grand Dukes, although I looked for them pretty assiduously. And Grand Duke, as you, I'm sure you know, is the title given to the sons and grandsons of Russian emperors. In any event, uh, Frederick went to Russia as the servant of this uh, grandee. And uh, after taking a look at St. Petersburg, Odessa, and Moscow, he settled on Moscow which is an interesting choice because it is the least European looking of those three cities. The Baydecker Guide, which was very popular for English language tourists on the eve of the First World War, said that if you want to see real Russia, you have to go to Moscow because St. Petersburg and Odessa look like Western European cities despite the polyglot nature of Odessan uh, society. And so Frederick then spent the next uh, 18 years in Moscow, the longest period of time that he spent anywhere except for his youth on the family farm in Cahoma County. And his life in general uh, followed a constantly rising curve of greater and greater success during those 18 years, whereas unfortunately the life curve of the country that he had chosen to settle in was going in the opposite direction. So he began again as a waiter. Then he became a head waiter in an entertainment garden. Then he became the assistant to the famous owner of the famous Yar restaurant in uh, Moscow, a man by the name of Alexei Sudakov, who also had a kind of similar background in that he had begun as a peasant boy in Yaroslavl and worked his way up from the restaurant floor uh, to become the owner of this place to which Russian Grand Dukes would come when they came from St. Petersburg and also the notorious Rasputin would go to uh, Yar to carouse when he came to Moscow on his nasty errands. At any rate, um, Frederick was by this point a uh, multilingual, sophisticated, uh, excellent psychologist because to be uh, the assistant to such a a place where such well-heeled well -heeled clients came. You had to be able to read people very well and deal with them. He made such generous tips, and Russians were particularly notorious for giving waiters and head waiters in those days tips like a gold cigarette case encrusted with diamonds and so on, that with two Russian partners, they took over, rented initially, a failed entertainment garden near the center of the city called Aquarium remnants of which still exist today. And um, the triumvirate uh, quickly became known in the theatrical press as Thomas and Company. So Frederick Thomas quickly became the leading figure in all of this. Um, within a year of their taking it over, they had turned the place around and each one of them had cleared, after all the expenses, in today's money a million dollars using the conversion tables that exist. Uh, taking a page out of his parents' uh, style of behaving, Frederick, the next year, opened a property of his own. Uh, Maxim, he called it. It's a property that also still exists, more or less, in Moscow on Balshaya Dmitrovka Street, if any of you know the city well enough, number 17. Um, and this was as big a success as was Aquarium. When the First World War began, uh, there was prohibition in the Russian Empire. And that was as successful in Russia as American <laughs> prohibition would be six years later. And so Frederick uh, 
like every other savvy entrepreneur in a position to make money from the illicit sale of alcoholic beverages, made money hand over fist. Uh, he bought himself a villa in Odessa um, as an investment. He bought a block of apartment buildings in Moscow as well, near the city center. He even made a play to take over the famous Chinizelli Circus building in St. Petersburg. Um, he did not neglect his personal life. He married twice during this period. His first wife was a simple woman from a humble background in East Prussia who bore him three very, very attractive children. I found photographs of them. She died of pneumonia in 1910. He married the nanny that they had because he had three kids to take care of. It was clearly a marriage of convenience because within a year of that marriage, he began an affair with a young and beautiful German singer and dancer who had performed on one of his stages, a woman who bore him two sons. He had a total of five children and who later uh, whom later he married after divorcing the wife of convenience and the third woman, uh, also German incidentally, uh, became his loyal companion to the end of his days. But of course, now we get to the historical curve. And you know perfectly well that during this period um, things went from bad to worse in Russia with occasional countercurrent moments, but basically uh, strikes, revolutions, artillery fire against striking workers in Moscow in 1905, assassinations, uh, the First World War uh, hit Russia very hard. Um, it sapped the country's strength. The political system became untenable, resulting in the revolutions of 1917. Uh, Frederick responded to the February Revolution, as Russians call it, um, uh, as someone who could try to adapt to it. He was nothing if not capable of adapting to different situations. So he modified what he put on his stages to make it more populist, in keeping with the times. Um, and things looked okay for a while, but when October came, uh, Frederick woke up on the wrong side of history. The fact that he had been an oppressed black man in the United States meant nothing to the Bolsheviks. He was a member of the wrong class. He was rich. Uh, he was in the category to be removed and destroyed. Um, he found out that he was on a list for arrest by the Chika. And so with some difficulty and subterfuge, he managed to escape with his part of his family, most of his family, to his villa in Odessa, which because of the Brest-Litovsk treaty, a peace treaty at the time was in German hands. So you could be on Russian soil, but out of the reach of the Bolsheviks. As many of you know, <coughs> this enclave was taken over by the French after the end of the First World War. There were great hopes on the parts of the many, many tens if not hundreds of thousands of white Russians who had taken refuge there, that a new crusade fostered by the Allies would begin in this enclave in the South to knock the Bolsheviks out of power. Of course, this did not happen. And when in April of 1919, the Bolsheviks were approaching Odessa, Frederick, during the badly mishandled French evacuation, managed to lie his way on board a ship that had been given to the foreign consuls to fill with their nationals. I could tell you uh, why and how he lied his way on board the ship, but that would be a spoiler. And so I'd rather you read the book and found out that way. Um, in any event, he wound up in Constantinople in um, the spring of 1919 after a hellish journey on a ship with about $25 to his name out of the millions that he had lost. Now he was already uh, in middle age by this point, uh, but he didn't give up. Uh, he wasn't about to acquiesce to try to find some kind of way to get by. He decided to try to rebuild everything he had lost. So he took out loans at usurious rates of 100% over the course of six months, and he opened a small entertainment garden on the outskirts of the city, which he immediately transformed into the most successful night spot in Constantinople. He also had the perfect audience for his initiatives because this was the occupation. So the city was filled with thousands of British, French, Italian, and American sailors, soldiers, officers, businessmen, and diplomats. And what these young men, for the most part, wanted more than anything was wine, women, and song. And there was nobody in Constantinople at this point who had had more experience in providing this on a sophisticated level 
Dan Thomas. I'm not suggesting that he was a pander or a pimp, but the kind of entertainment that these men liked uh, included frequently attractive women dancing on stage. In fact, it's interesting to note, uh, although this is looking ahead of my story a little bit, that accusations began to circulate among racist whites in Constantinople that Thomas was taking advantage of the women who worked for him. And an American uh, reporter who was friends with him uh, looked into it and wrote the most uh, highly ranked American in the city, Admiral Mark Bristol, that this is an arrant lie and that in fact as far as Frederick Thomas's um, uh, employees, women employees are concerned, um, he was in the idiom of the time, it's also of course uh, marked, the whitest employer around. I mean there's obvious irony in the way that's phrased but you understand the historical context. Um, this is not where free iPads are being given out. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's what you thought was happening, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I, I would be happy to do it, but I don't have any. <laughs> so um, I'm telling the story of this remarkable man, Frederick Bruce Thomas, about whom I was lucky enough to write a book. But at any rate, Frederick managed to overcome all of the obstacles that he was facing, which were largely financial ones. He got himself on a solid a financial footing. Tourism returned to Constantinople uh, beginning in the early 1920s and what tourists who came there wanted was to go see Hagia Sophia, to see the Blue Mosque and to have a really stiff drink at Thomas's Maxim nightclub because it was after all prohibition in the United States and he was famous for being a terrific host, for serving good liquor and for playing hot jazz because he imported jazz to Turkey as a result of which he came, became known as the Sultan of Jazz toward the end of his life. Um, then history shifted under Frederick Thomas's feet yet again in a way that he tried to fight but in the end failed to uh, fight. Uh, the Ottoman Empire in effect ended formally with the proclamation of the Turkish Republic in 1923. Um, the Turkish Republic was xenophobic in comparison to the Ottoman Empire which gave perks to foreigners, to Europeans. Um, Atatürk wanted Turkey for the Turks. So it became difficult for uh, foreigners like Frederick to continue to uh, practice his business in the new Constantinople, in the new country that had been born. Frederick tried to get Turkish citizenship but he wasn't successful. The Turks were not eager to hand that out uh, readily to foreigners. The country that had adopted Frederick and that he had adopted in turn, the Russian Empire had ceased to exist. He wanted nothing to do with Soviet Russia because if he had gone back, uh, he would have probably have been killed. So he turned to the only other sort of geopolitical entity direction that he could think of, which was the Americans. He applied for recognition as an American and the Americans turned him down. They turned him down for reasons of pure racism, um, although there was a technical reason that they invoked. What happened is he applied at the Consulate General in Constantinople. The diplomats there filled out forms, sent them to the State Department in Washington, D.C. The clerks in Washington, D.C. went through their records and wrote back saying there is no evidence in our files that this man was ever an American citizen. Now this is either an outright lie or absolutely staggering ineptitude because when I started digging in the State Department archives at the early stages of my work on this book, I found all kinds of documents indicating that the State Department had recognized Frederick Bruce Thomas as an American. Among other things, I found eight applications for passports that he had filed from various places in Western Europe and Russia, which get sent to the State Department for uh, cataloging and which are the pretext for giving a man, in this case a man, a passport. So those were then and still are in the State Department files in addition to much else. What happened was that uh, there was racism of various kinds in the State Department, anti-Semitism as well, um, people in Constantinople and in the State Department resented the trails of glory that the tales of glory that this man had brought with him from Moscow. They resented that he had a white woman as his wife. They refused to believe uh, 
that she was his wife. They refused uh, to so believe So thank you for listening. You know, Russians have a saying that you don't have to feed me, just let me talk. So uh, <laughs> thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's such a fascinating story, and there's so <coughs> many resonances to this as well. Because Mustafa Kemal was in was in Istanbul, Constantinople at the very time he was staying in the Para Palace, which was next to the Garden Bar, which was down the, the road from where Maxim would would yeah. eventually be. So all of these people are sort of meeting each other in this in this milieu. And in reading the book, one of the longer term resonances I thought about was that, of course, the musical world that Frederick Thomas helps to create is one of the things that inspires a young man by the 1930s, Ahmed Ertegun, who eventually comes to the United States, is also inspired by the jazz scene in Washington. Because and becomes a great entrepreneur here. And he yeah. becomes the founder of Atlantic Records. Yeah. And in a way, uh, from it comes you know, back. Ray Charles on, the whole story yeah. kind of comes back. This, um, this, it's this amazing you know, world in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a raindrop that I think you, you've um, uh, exposed for all of us. Yeah, one aspect of that that I've always been intrigued by is that Frederick's livelihood was to provide uh, mixed sex entertainment, to put this in crude abstract terms. In other words, where women would dance with men in nightclubs and spend time together socially. This went against the grain of Ottoman uh, behavior and, and cultural patterns. And Frederick did this because this is what he was used to. But this initiative of his of creating nightclubs that encouraged men and women to interact socially fed directly into Atatürk's secularization program. And there are anecdotes of Atatürk trying to get his officers uh, to dance at balls. And he would announce, you know, that there are Turkish ladies arrayed over there and his officers are on the other side. He would say, no Turkish lady will refuse a request uh, to dance from a Turkish officer now. So he himself was moving society toward this kind of Western form of behavior. And he was also not a teetotaler, um, to put it mildly. <laughs> and so the kind of alcoholic you know, buzz that was part of the scene that Frederick fostered uh, is something that Atatürk looked kindly upon, too. Right. And, uh, also well, Atatürk was called the Peter the Great of Turkey. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, there's, uh, I mean, the whole pattern. Of, uh, I'm obsessed with intertextuality, but now it's uh, it's improving a lot. Right. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that's very interesting is how Putin actually changed the story of uh, Abraham the way of the changes was something that I was very much in mind of by the uh, supposedly Indian version. Well, yeah, although it's... He flipped some of the details to make them... Uh, sometimes you need to make things uh, kind of more plausible by, by making it more of a lie. But you know, all of these, all of these inventions are um, very interesting and signify. And in the case of the story about the Native American past, um, which was generated not by Frederick but by his son Mikhail, who lived in Paris before, during, and after the Second World War, and who died in Paris in eighty-seven, um, Henry Louis Gates Jr., the eminent scholar at Harvard, has recently been doing a lot of work on uh, African-American genealogy. And he's been doing DNA analyses as well to supplement the kind of genealogical research that he's been doing you know, in widely publicized venues. And I heard him give a talk recently where he described how uh, DNA analyses of African-Americans shows that there is perhaps 2% of the total GNA in, uh, DNA inheritance that can be traced to Native Americans, just 2%. Whereas in terms of family histories, it's far more prevalent. And he explains this in a way that makes sense, and makes sense for the Thomases as well, that it is less uh, onerous to think of your ancestors as being Native Americans than as being enslaved Africans. And so that's the way he explains it. And I'm guessing that when uh, Mikhail Fyodorovich Thomas, if we were to call him officially in Russian style, got to the West, uh, he began to generate 
this kind of a myth, in part because his sense of being black was modified uh, by interactions perhaps with Americans. It shouldn't have happened in Paris alone because Paris remained uh, racially tolerant in comparison to the United States in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's an invention that can be decoded to, say, to tell you something more about the family's psyche, I think. Well, it varied. I mean, he, he Thomas. Jazz, it was only oh, the yeah. Time of, uh, That's only after 1919. Now, Thomas had a very good ear and a nose for innovation. So, whenever something new happened in popular entertainment, even if it was an act on the vaudeville stage, uh, he would import it frequently at great cost from Western Europe put it on his stage or stages in Moscow and wow the audiences so that reviews of his vaudeville shows, of the operettas that he put on, of the farcical plays that he put on, uh, were always very popular. These were, in cultural terms, low-brow, but they brought in the crowds and they brought in the money. Uh, music was the same thing. When the tango on the eve of the First World War became the dance craze of the world, he immediately transformed a hall in his aquarium garden into the tango salon with enormous paintings on the walls showing couples doing the tango. There was a dance called the machish that preceded the tango. That also was something that he fostered. When he got to uh, Istanbul, in addition to uh, putting on jazz bands on his stages, he encouraged people to dance and he would provide instruction. There were instructors who could teach you the latest steps, even if it was just, you know, the foxtrot or the shimmy, other dances that were popular at that time. I don't think there was... No, I, I mean, he, he would have in his establishments in uh, uh, Constantinople jazz on the one hand, and Nastya Polyakova belting out gypsy romances on the other. Uh, occasionally there would be a traditional Turkish folk uh, ensemble that would perform, but that was very rare. Uh, so I'm not aware that during his tenure there was any kind of a musical fusion that took place. But from what I understand, and you know more about this, once jazz was grafted onto Turkish soil, it survived and it flourished and there were forms of jazz that took place in the Maxim nightclub that had belonged to Thomas, which he lost to creditors. The creditors incidentally renamed it in Turkish the Yeni Maxim, which means the new Maxim. And they played jazz of a sort that began to hybridize with local uh, Turkish melodic traditions. So what jazz developed in Turkey was specifically then becoming Turkish inflected jazz, as far as I understand. Yeah. I think, that, and, and we know we we can listen to that because uh, his master's voice recorded some recorded of this stuff, stuff in yeah. the very late 1920s and 1930s. And but the people who played for him were, for the most part, touring musicians from other countries, from Western Europe, both white and black jazz musicians. Yeah, very little. Um, he was, uh, Thomas was basically very largely forgotten everywhere in the world. But by digging through uh, old uh, Russian theatrical memoirs uh, by people who uh, remembered pre-revolutionary popular um, theatrical life in Moscow, I found occasional references to Thomas. Uh, some, you know, very quotable paragraphs that I included in the book. Um, the kinds of entertainments he provided, um, how he treated his employees, for example. Uh, you know, chorus girls in Russia and in the rest of the world in those days were considered to be more or less available to male clients for at least for spending time together, if not for more. And there are very touching memoirs of a young Russian woman 
who wound up performing on stage in a way that she did not expect to have to do, uh, who remembered Frederick Thomas and the other maitre d'hôtel at this particular establishment as looking out for her interests and swooping in to remove alcoholic beverages that had been poured to her by clients who wanted to get her drunk and so on. So this is a constant refrain of his interactions with employees and fellow employees. He was very humane. Uh, so yes, to the short answer is that yes, I did find fragmentary recollections, but most of my information comes from contemporary theatrical publications um, of the Russian theatrical press uh, up through 1918. By 1918, the quality of the print and the paper starts to deteriorate markedly, and then they stop altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Some people remember. Okay. Yeah, I don't know Turkish, and I don't know Ottoman, which is the language that was used through the later 20s, but I relied on acquaintances and friends for this kind of information. And some people very kindly dug through things, and there, there is evidence that some people who are particularly interested in the history of Western music in Turkey are aware of the existence in the distant past in the 20s of this enigmatic black Russian fellow, Frederick Thomas and that he was instrumental in bringing jazz to Turkey. But, you know, jazz caught on so quickly that his nightclub stopped being the unique place for it very rapidly as well. I mentioned this Yildiz Kiosk casino plan, this palace that was transformed into a gambling hall. They had multiple jazz bands because they were trying to capitalize on the popularity of this new form of music. But he at least gets credit for being the first. No, you know, he didn't. And that suggests to me that he did not really believe in it because he was such a committed person about things that mattered to him that I think he would have pursued it. But in a strange way, his interest in singing influenced his children because his son Mikhail in Paris sung in a Russian emigre nightclub called Shekherizad. He sang both Russian torch songs and uh, spirituals. And his two youngest sons, who had a miserable time of it for a long time in Turkey before they got out, both tried to make a living as jazz singers, uh, something that they could do sort of in between the legalities of working in Turkey. And that, to me, suggests that this did not come out of nowhere. It came out of the father's interest in it. But I don't know anything about his own attempts to try to pursue a musical career later. He became an entrepreneur. Thanks very much. This is a fascinating, fascinating life. And I mean, we have books for sale um, back there. I encourage you to, to pick one up. It's also, if I may say, <coughs> a splendid read, um, in addition to being a wonderful life. Just be Thank you very much. So thanks, thanks everyone. Time.